Welcome back to another edition of Components Breakdown. Today we're going to take a look at an older but very popular game that was originally released in 2003 by Fantasy Flight Games called A Game of Thrones The Board Game. A Game of Thrones is a strategic war game that is centered around the first book in the incredibly popular series of fantasy novels entitled A Song of Ice and Fire by the American novelist and screenwriter George R.R. R. Martin. The novels and corresponding game both focus on the political and military struggles of several great noble houses and the lands of Westeros as they contend for the ultimate seat of power upon the Iron Throne. In a Game of Thrones, up to five players will compete over ten possible rounds through resource management, diplomacy, and cunning tactical use of their armies in order to secure dominance over the land and each other. Now, there are also two expansions that are currently available. However, I will strictly be reviewing only the base game at this time, and will leave myself open to explore and report on the expansions at a later and more appropriate date. However, filming, editing, and producing a video for this particular game couldn't have come at a more opportune time for me than right now, as the popularity and relevance of the novels has reached a much larger audience due to the currently running, and I must say wonderfully produced television series that is airing on HBO. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at the game. The main feature of A Game of Thrones is the game board itself, and is divided into several different sections. The largest and most utilized of these areas represents the divisions of sea and land upon the continent of Westeros. And it is here that players will be maneuvering their house's units in order to control the various sets of valuable resources and supplies that are required to field and support their armies. The other four sections of the game board include the Wildling Attack Track, the three areas of influence, the supply track, and finally the game turn track. Briefly in that same order, the wildling attack track represents the growing strength of the unknown hordes of the north who are continuously invading the lands of Westeros, and when they attack, all players must contribute their house's power to combat this threat or communally suffer the consequences of a defeat by removing some of their units from the game board. The three areas of influence on the board, which include the Iron Throne, the Fiefdoms, and the King's Court, each represent a particular level of strength that a house holds over that specific claim, each of which grants the highest bidder a very powerful set of privileges for every round in which they hold dominion over that area of influence. The supply track has the distinct function of creating a visual scale that allows players to monitor the maximum size of each of the five houses' total armies in relationship to the total number of supplies that are available to them through the territories that they control. So in other words, just like in a modern day military, an army can only be as large as its supply chain allows. And without an adequate supply to back their campaigns, an army is going to quickly deteriorate and scatter. And this is really what the supply track denotes. Finally, just as the name implies, the game turn track is going to be used to mark the 10 possible turns that could take place in a Game of Thrones before its final conclusion. To set up the game, each player will randomly draw one of the five house start cards to determine which house that they will control for the remainder of the game. These start cards describe the locations of the house's starting units on the game board and provide each of the players with their initial placement of tokens on the three areas influence and supply tracks. After the houses are chosen, each player will also receive seven unique house cards that represent the important characters in the novels that are associated with that specific house. And these character cards are going to be used in battle when players decide to march their armies upon another player's units. Now, there are three basic types of units in the base game, those being the footmen, the knights, and the ships, each of which has a particular strength and cost to muster that are associated with each of them. Now, these units are essentially the pieces that represent the military might of your house and will move throughout the board in an effort to both expand and defend the lands that you currently have. Each player will also receive five of their house power tokens from the general supply to start the game. Power tokens are primarily used for three main purposes, most of which occur at random times within the game. Those being to bid for each of the three areas of influence when there is a clash of kings, to combat the wildling attacks when they occur, or to mark the locations on the game board that the player last controlled but has since moved their units from.
Each house is also provided with 15 round double-sided order tokens, three each of March, Support, Raid, Defense, and Consolidate Power. Order tokens are used during the planning phase and allow each of the five houses to give hidden orders to each group of units within an area that players have on the game board during a turn, and are very much the primary mechanic that drives the majority of the tactical and strategic gameplay in a Game of Thrones. The last set of components I'm going to discuss are the Westeros cards, which are divided into three distinct groups and really represent these special events and sometimes mundane tasks that take place within the land. Westeros cards provide a sort of random element to the game, though mostly are fairly uniform in nature, usually allowing players the ability to adjust their supply tracks at specific points, muster their units, or even prevent certain orders from occurring during an entire round. Now let's briefly touch on the gameplay. Now I very casually went over the game's setup and components, and I'm going to do the same with the gameplay because there is a lot going on in a Game of Thrones that really needs to be discovered firsthand in order to be truly understood. Not to mention all the different aspects of good strategic play, the bluffing, the negotiations, and everything else that take place each and every turn. And there's just a multitude of different possibilities that can take place, so I'll keep the gameplay portion to a minimum. The game can be won in one of two different ways. First, if at any time a player controls seven areas on the game board that contain any combination of cities and strongholds, the game will immediately end and that house is declared the winner. Alternatively, the game will automatically conclude at the end of the 10th turn, with the player who controls the most areas containing any combinations of cities and strongholds winning the game. Therefore, the game really boils down to a race to control and defend as many tactical locations on the game board as possible while trying to remain as neutral as one can in the larger scale of things. Just like in the novels, A Game of Thrones is all about walking a line between loyalty and deception, and players are encouraged to work together by seeking alliances and then breaking them when the situation suits them best. In order for this to happen, the game is broken into three main phases for each of the game's possible 10 turns. The first phase is usually the quickest and is entitled the Westeros phase. It is during this time that players will turn over the top card of all three decks and resolve them in turn order. Again, the Westeros cards represent the numerous special events that take place within the game, each of which help or hinder the group of houses as a whole. The next phase is the planning phase, which presents the game's majority of strategic choices that need to be made. In summary, during this phase, players will simultaneously secretly place one of their order tokens face down on each area that contains at least one of their units. During this time, players can essentially openly discuss with other players what their plans might be for that turn, such as defending a specific location or marching upon another, or asking for support in a joint attack that might take place. However, since orders are placed face down and in secret, players may choose to present false pretenses to other players at their leisure, and no promises in the game are ever binding. This is a really clever part of the game's design that fits the mood and the theme of the novels almost perfectly, as players will constantly second-guess their enemies as well as their allies, and that creates the much-needed sense of tension that a game with this namesake so rightly deserves. Now, once all players have secretly placed an order face down upon each area that is occupied by one or a group of their units, players will simultaneously reveal all their order tokens on the board by simply turning them face up in the same spot in which they were placed. The third and final phase of a game turn is called the action phase, and it is during this time that players will actually enact each of these orders in the predetermined turn order. Now there are a lot of rules that dictate what each of these five possible order tokens that I previously showed are capable of doing. And I don't want to confuse anyone or laboriously pour over each one until I lose everyone's attention, so let me sum them up in just a couple of words. Order tokens provide five different basic abilities. Two are very simple to understand, those being marching and defending. Marching allows you to move your armies to an adjacent space, attacking any opposing house units that are already currently located in that space, while defending simply allows you to boister your strength if you fear that you might be the target of an oncoming attack. Support allows you to provide the strength of your units from that location to any adjacent location, even to other houses if you so desire. 
Raids allow you to remove another player's adjacent order from the game board before it takes place, as long as that order was not a march or defend order. Last is Consolidate Power, which is the primary and most reliable way in which to accumulate the additional power tokens from your general supply. Now there are a lot of rules that I'm simply not going to cover here, including how combat is handled, ship transport, neutral forces, wildling attacks, retreats, and so forth. It would just take far too long to describe the amount of detail that I feel is required to teach it properly. But I think at this point players will at least have enough information to make an informed decision on whether or not this is the right game for them. A Game of Thrones is most definitely a very contentious style of game, and all the diplomacy is often the most desired route to achieving your long-term goals. Balancing that neutrality can actually be very difficult, since it often leads to direct confrontation at one point or another with your enemies as well as your most supportive allies. And for those who are fans of the series, you will appreciate this aspect even more since political entry plays such an important piece within the lands of Westeros. That's not to say that this is a game for everyone who enjoys diplomatic or thematic style games though, as players need to be aware that if they prefer friendlier types of games, then this most certainly will probably turn them off, as you will be attacking your friends, destroying their armies, and taking their lands from them when the opportunities present themselves. However, if you do enjoy alliance style games where double crossing and cutthroat mentality play a major role in the game's design, then a Game of Thrones is most definitely a strong recommendation. The game is not without a few other issues though, most of which are addressed in the expansions, however a few still pose issues with players who are interested in the gameplay. First, the game can be long, upwards of 4 hours if players have difficulty making decisions or are AP prone, which can result in some downtime when other players are in combat or are discussing alliances with one another that do not affect you directly. Also, A Game of Thrones does allow for player elimination, which does happen from time to time if players are attacked on multiple fronts by houses who are completely hell-bent on taking their lands and resources away from them. All in all though, A Game of Thrones thus far has been a wonderful experience in spite of these few drawbacks that I've had with the base game, but I truly feel like it's a very inspired game design that reflects the mood of the novels almost perfectly. It's a game that requires its players to continually balance their supplies, their power, and their positions on the three tracks of influence in order to gain even the slightest of advantages over their opponents. And at each turn they must both outguess and outmaneuver their opposition by ordering their units intelligently in order to gain the upper hand. The most important feature of all to me though is that players really are forced to work together for the greater good of their houses even when they don't want to, because it's very hard in this game to go it alone and make any real progress, especially against experienced players, which creates a tension in the game that few other diplomatic style war games have been able to mimic. It's a very fascinating game that with the right audience of players can become something truly special. So that is A Game of Thrones, I am Jeremy Salinas and thank you very much for watching.